Well, I'm excited to be joined by Timothy Alvarino. Timothy is an explorer and a researcher who's been really featured as a guest on many programs, including the History Channel's Ancient Aliens TV show. He's a filmmaker of the True Legends documentary series, and I think he's got some other new documentaries in the works. He's also the author of the new book, Birthright. Timothy, thanks so much for joining me on Megalithic Marvels. I'm very happy to be here with you. So I've been uh, reading your new book, and I am really stuck between chapters seven and eight uh, because I feel that they are so packed full of ancient insight that relates uh, directly to megalithic history and architecture. Uh, in chapter seven, you've titled it The Golden Age. You make the statements, quote, the descent and habitation of the gods among men was no small occurrence in the minds of the ancients. Memorialized in mythology of culture far and wide, it was the single most significant event ever to have happened on planet Earth. In the Golden Age, the gods copulated with human women who conceived and gave birth to the golden race, hybrid half-breed heroes of the old world, end quote. Uh, wow. Timothy, tell us more about this golden race and who were these hybrid half-breed heroes of the old world? Well, most people have heard of the Golden Age. The, the, the term Golden Age has been used and misused um, over and over, uh, even, in, uh, even in, in many movies and in many books. And, and just the term Golden Age itself is all, it's recycled for, for anything. And there's the Golden Age of rock and roll, the Golden Age of this or that, of Hollywood. So we recycle this term over and over, but we, we don't often consider the origin of the term golden age, where does it actually come from? And what is, what does it actually mean? Because the term golden age, the concept of the golden age is universal in the ancient world. It's universal. You can go to the middle East, you can go up to the Germanic uh, nations, you can go uh, across the Atlantic to South America, and you are going to find this conceptualized period of time uh, called the golden age. Um, the golden age to the Greeks, because that's where that we actually get the terminology from, but it's designated with different terms across the earth, but it, but the same, it's the same concept. It's the same conceptualization of the dateless past when, uh, when something very important happened on planet earth, that all of these ancient cultures are memorializing. Uh, we get the term golden age, uh, that, that specific terminology from the Greeks, uh, the Greeks talked about the, the ages of the earth and, and uh, that the most, um, the most uh, blessed time, the most blissful time on earth was this time that they designated as the golden age. This was the time in which the gods lived among men. And, and, and not only did they live among men, not only, not only did they co-inhabit the earth, cohabitate the earth with the human species, they actually copulated with human women, uh, they they copulated and they procreated families on Earth. So you have the uh, you have the the these mythical figures such as Hercules and and so forth, who were the offspring of the gods and men. And these figures are uh, oftentimes referred to as the golden race. Um, and uh, again, throughout the world you can find mythology related to that general theme, that there was a point in time when the gods lived among men and it was the most blessed time on earth. It was the most wonderful time. It was a time of great knowledge, a proliferation of knowledge and wisdom from the gods. The, uh, the Egyptians remember it as Zeptepi, the first time. And Zeptepi was the time when Osiris and the other gods dwelt among men and copulated with human women and gave birth to a hybrid offspring who became the, the kings and the rulers of Egypt. It's universal. Uh, this narrative can be, uh, can be found in the written records and oral traditions of every major culture on earth. So something really important here is being recorded. Um, and uh, the golden age is 
um, also associated with a great cataclysm that annihilated uh, the civilization that existed during that time, that, that, that destroyed, that brought to ruin the world of the gods, the empire of the gods, as I call it in my book. Um, so the ancients universally remember this golden age period of time, the first time, Zeptepi, to the Egyptians, and they remember the cataclysmic ruination of, of the old world, as, as I designated in my book. The old world, we think of the old world as, uh, you know, the old European system, the post-Roman um, uh, Empire world, uh, leading up to the Victorian times. To us, that's what we think of when we think of the old world. And we're living now in the new world. But to the ancients, the old world was the antediluvian world, the world before the flood. And you're going to find in the mythos of, again, many diverse cultures, you're going to find a uh, record of a cataclysmic event or a series of cataclysms that, that rock the earth in the distant past, but most of the time, most of the time, you're going to find uh, that the ancients are remembering a flood, a deluge more than anything else, because it's the deluge that really was sort of the nail in the coffin of this cataclysm. And of course there were earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and so forth, probably due to the impact of an asteroid or a comet, um, or perhaps some other kind of uh, cosmological event that occurred um, but one thing is for sure, it precipitated a massive flood, perhaps a universal flood, or at least flooding all over the earth, um, because it is recorded so universally. Now, one of the reasons why we have uh, this ubiquitous record of the golden age and of the cataclysm that brought it to ruin, the empire of the gods, is because... Uh, after this cataclysm, uh, mankind was reduced to most accounts say one family. Of course, we're all familiar with the biblical account that talks about Noah and his three sons and their wives. And so all of the information from the golden age was only preserved in one family. So all of the knowledge and the history and the culture and the language came through one family, was preserved through the cataclysm. Some other mythos, some other myths talk about, you know, other individuals or groups of people who survived. And, um, but the idea is that the knowledge from the old world, the empire of the gods, all of that knowledge and learning was lost. And, uh, and only some of it survived through one family or one group of people who then began to repopulate the earth post flood. And, uh, and so the stories of the golden, of, of the antediluvian world of the golden age, all those stories, all those oral traditions uh, began uh, from one point of origin. And which I think is very clearly the middle East. Um, and even more specifically uh, right around the uh, Mount Hermon area, the Mount Ararat, that, that general region in there, uh, where in, in uh, Southern Turkey, Northern Syria, that, that, that area, nobody knows exactly where, but um, you know, it's in, in, the, in the region of Gobekli Tepe and, and some of those most ancient um, ruins, megalithic ruins. So it's all very interesting and um, some people believe that the Golden Age mythos is referring to a high civilization, a human civilization that existed in the antediluvian world, that just, uh, just normal everyday human beings, but that were able to progress to an astounding level in terms of their technological capabilities and their knowledge. And by the way, the technological capabilities of the ancients, of the, of the antediluvians, would not resemble our technology. Um, there is not only one path of technology. If we, if we imagine uh, our current course of, uh, the, the current course that we've taken in technological development is only one path. It's, it's, it's like uh, the stem of a tree that branches out into, you know, into many shoots and branches. 
we've taken one of those branches in terms of our technological development. We've gone very mechanical using combustion and using electricity. Uh, but that is certainly not the only way to develop technology. It's the way we have developed technology in the modern age. But it's very possible that the ancients had taken some other courses in terms of technological development and discovered some things that we have yet to discover in the modern age. And they were using other kinds of technologies based on, you know, based on the same laws of science that we have, this, this, uh, the same um, uh, based on the laws of nature, the universal laws of nature and the scientific principles that we are aware of today, but perhaps they knew some things that we didn't because they were thinking in a different way. They weren't just thinking combustion and electricity. We make things move through the creation of explosions. That's how your car moves, you know, it's internal combustion. Combustion is an explosion. So we use, um, we use gasoline, we use oil to create these explosions. That's how we propel things. It's a very, uh, it's a very aggressive way of, of uh, and and frankly, not the not the best way uh, to um, to create propulsion. There's lots of other ways that could be harnessed. Lots of other things, and and there's theories out there, uh, you know, solar energy and all kinds of things that the ancients might have been tapping into that might have taken them on a different developmental route. So when we talk about technology in the deep past, you know, don't, I always tell people, don't go looking for laptops and Lamborghinis because that's not the kind of technology that they were developing when we talk about technology. I don't know what kind of technology they were developing, but, it's, but I'm fairly certain it wasn't our kind of technology. They weren't interested in social media and, and they didn't have internet and things like that. Um, and so sometimes I think we get very narrow minded when we think about technology, we think that our technology is the only kind of technology that could possibly be conceived of, when in reality, who knows what other kinds of technologies could have been, it, we're talking communications technologies, we're talking about propulsion technologies, we're talking about uh, uh, weapons technologies, using the laws of science and physics and using the, the natural resources in a different way than we do today. And so I just went on a little tangent there and I apologize for that. You mentioned that um, it's not so much that there was a, an advanced civilization during the golden age, but an advanced fraternity within the civilization, what you call the golden race. I yes. found this idea very interesting because you know, when you hear about an ancient advanced civilization, you hear about a civilization like it was everybody. Everybody was advanced. Yeah. So, man, this was a very intriguing thought that it was actually probably a fraternity. So tell us a little bit more about this fraternity, these rulers, the elite of the day, and what might their uh, anatomy have been like? This is a very intriguing point that you raise here because... <clears throat> we often make the mistake, those of us who are interested in, in, uh, in these topics, we often make the mistake of having either or rather than both and when we think about the antediluvian world, when we think about the deep past 12,000 plus years ago, right? So we either think it, it was either a bunch of brutish Bronze Age people or Stone Age people, right? Or it was an advanced civilization, and I don't think that either of those perceptions are entirely correct. I think that what you're dealing with is the mix of the two. You're dealing with an elite group of individuals or perhaps a civilization like an Atlantean empire or something like that. But the vast majority of the populace is not on the same level technologically or in possession of the same knowledge. The vast majority of the populace is living at a Bronze Age or a Stone Age level. So, so it's the idea of this, you know, what I believe the ancients refer to as the golden race, that there was an elite um, brotherhood uh, of, of people, of entities living in the antediluvian world who were privy to certain knowledge that they used to dominate, that they used to subjugate the rest of the human populace on earth. Um, now, let me make it clear right off the bat that there are two dichotomous perspectives of, of the deep past, 12,000 plus years ago, what's, you know, what we refer to as the Stone Age. Um, for people thinking about alternative history, there's two dichotomous ways to think about this. And they're totally dichotomous because 
on the one hand, you have most of, the, of, of the cultures around the earth, the ancient records, when they remember the golden age, they remember it very fondly and with longing. They look back to the golden age as this was the height of uh, bliss on planet earth. And they mourn the loss of, of the world of the gods. They mourn the, the, uh, the fact that this great cataclysm brought their world um, to, a, to a swift and abrupt end. And, and they're always longing for the return of the golden age and, the, and, and always hoping that the gods will one day descend again to the earth and share their knowledge and so forth. That's um, very prevalent in, we can call that the, in the pagan worldview. But then you have, on the other hand, you have um, the Hebrew worldview, the ancient Hebrew worldview, which views the, and, and we can call that the biblical worldview, which views the golden age and the advent of the descent of the watchers and so forth, the descent of the gods and, the, and their commingling with men and so forth, um, and, and, and copulating with women, procreating offspring, hybrid offspring. From the biblical perspective, that was a dystopic nightmare. That was the worst time on earth. It was a time in which the human race was subjugated to the offspring of the gods who in the biblical account were giants. Uh, and it was remembered as a time of great wickedness and evil. Um, and there's elements of that in, in a lot of these other stories like Atlantis, for example, the story of Atlantis is that the people became wicked basically. And so they were punished in there and, and, you know, in a cataclysm, um, so, so you have you have um, you have the same sentiments still flowing through the pagan accounts, but but the Hebrew account is very stark in that, it, as I said, it views the antediluvian world as a as as a dystopian nightmare. It was just awful. It was not a good time to be alive. The knowledge that the gods had 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 um, had imparted to mankind. Uh, wrought great chaos and bloodshed on the earth. It didn't elevate mankind. It wasn't like this wonderful time of wisdom and knowledge. It was, in, in fact, the opposite. It was the beginning of, of brutal warfare. And it was in, in ma the mass slaughtering of, of people through, through, uh, uh, through warfare and through, this, through uh, all of the other uh, things that the Watchers were teaching that the gods were teaching to men and, and that the mankind was being corrupted, morally corrupted. So, so you have these two very dichotomous views. And, and I think that the best, the best um, dichotomy here is the Hebrew account and the Egyptian account. The Egyptian account, you have Osiris is here on earth at Zeptepi the first time. Osiris is going around civilizing you're on this mission of, of the civilizing mission, going around the earth, civilizing these primitive cultures, you know, uh, bringing harmony, teaching them that they should, uh, you know, um, um, that they should have fear laws and they should treat each other um, with kindness and that they should have systems of justice and teaching them the civilizing principles, writing and reading and so forth. That's the Egyptian. That's what the Egyptians are saying about Zeptepi. Again, the Hebrew account could not be, uh, could not be uh, more dichotomous. It could not, um, it's the polar opposite view, which I find very intriguing because only one of those can be, can be correct. I mean, um, perhaps there's a middle ground uh, view where it was, it was both of those things, maybe a little both of those things going on, but um, so that I find that very intriguing, and that's very important to to remember when when thinking about the golden age. It's there's there's very different perspectives um, uh, about uh, its benefit to mankind, um, and so uh, wh whatever the case, again, all of the ancients record that it came to an abrupt end in cataclysm. So. Again, these are some things that, that I think people uh, get confused about, um, not only the, 
that dichotomy I was talking about between the Egyptian view and the Hebrew view, but also returning to the point of the, the, the idea that everybody alive, those who subscribe to the alternate view of history, that everybody alive at that time was somehow enjoying this advanced civilization uh, or, or that everybody alive at that time were, were cavemen. And again, I think it's a very complex mix where you have a, you have the golden race, you have this, you have, you have, again, it's like this, this brotherhood, the offspring of the gods, the gods and their offspring are privy to the knowledge, are privy to the technology, are subjugating the other cultures. And, and that's even, there's even, um, you can even find the residue of this concept in the Atlantean tale, because Atlantis was a, an empire and it was a, According to the myth, uh, especially um, in Plato's Critias and Timaeus, Atlantis was an, was an empire that was on a war path and that had subjugated other continents and other nations. So this was not just a peaceful, loving, you know, civilization, according to the myth. This was a civilization that used its technological might to subjugate it, subjugate its neighbors, presumably uh, Bronze Age or Stone Age level people. As Plato relates the tale of Atlantis that mentions that the gods distributed the whole earth into portions and made themselves temples and that Poseidon, I believe, was given the island of Atlantis. Um, any ideas on how the earth might have been portioned off as like this and and do you think atlantis actually existed itself or was that more of an allegory of this old world well i think we need to back up and and describe define who we what we mean by the gods because again we're going to have we're going to run into two perspectives here actually there's three perspectives here that i are most prevalent a the one that's the, the, the popular view now with the masses is the ancient astronaut theory, right? That the gods were aliens, were actually an extraterrestrial race that descended and so forth. That's one, that's one perspective. Um, B, that the gods were just enlightened humans, that the gods were just advanced from an advanced civilization, right? That they were just human beings, uh, but they were very advanced human beings. Or C, that the gods were in a more in a biblical sense that the gods were non-human exalted beings transcendent beings that descended to the earth not necessarily just an alien faction extraterrestrial faction as as uh conceptualized by the ancient astronaut theorists but but more in the biblical sense that these are more like uh what 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 christians call fallen angels um <clears throat> Uh, so those are three. Those are three perspectives. I would say the three prevailing perspectives on who the gods were. And nobody really believes that the gods were who the Egyptians thought they were, or you know who the who the Sumerians thought they were. That these were actual deities who could do the things that uh, were are described in the religious texts. Um, most people kind of just assume that 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 that's mythos. That that's just that's mythology. Um, it's it's fanciful. So, uh, it, so when we talk about the gods and apportioning the, the their empire, uh, we have to pick one of those perspectives and then narrow in on it and then drill down on it because they all have a different explanation. Um, and what I'm most familiar with and what I personally subscribe to is the biblical worldview. And so I believe that there was. Uh, According to the Book of Enoch, which is an extra biblical text um, uh, that was discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the Book of Enoch describes in great detail what occurred from the biblical perspective in that there were 200 watchers, what the, what the Book of Enoch describes and what the Bible describes as watchers uh, who descended to the earth in the days of Jared in the antediluvian world, and they had a very specific uh, purpose in mind and, and, and they desired to do something um, and this gets complicated but in my book I talk about what I believe were the three primary motives of the watchers why they did it um, and uh, I'm trying to remember the three things that I had that, that I list there but 
but certainly they wanted to to have sex with with human women. I mean, that's clear in the biblical account and in the book of Enoch that these watchers lusted after human women. They desired to copulate with them. So that's a very basic carnal impulse uh, that drew the watchers to the earth. They were looking at the daughters of, of men, the daughters of Adam, and, uh, and they found them to be very attractive. Okay, so that's one element uh, that drew them here. And that was, that's, that's one of the motivations of what they were doing on the earth. But that's not the only motivation because the book of Enoch further describes the machinations of the watchers as not only did they want to copulate with these women, they wanted to procreate. They wanted offspring. So that's the second thing. They didn't just want to come down and and have intercourse with human women. They wanted to procreate families, which is very important to some of the theological content that I have in my book that I, that I described um, concerning the, again, the machinations of the watchers and, 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 and the, and the different things that were, the different elements of that. And so the third compulsion, the third thing that was drawing the watchers to the earth, and I think is the most overlooked and probably the most important, um, especially as we talk about why they were apportioning the earth among themselves. And that, that third component is they wanted dominion of the earth. They wanted to take over. They wanted to rule the earth. So those are the three components. You combine those together. They wanted to copulate with human women. They had sexual impulse. They wanted to procreate offspring and they wanted their offspring, they and their offspring to rule over the earth. And this, this, um, these three components fit into the pagan narratives, the other narratives concerning Atlantis and so forth, because you have the gods doing those very things, don't you? You have the gods taking human women. For example, Poseidon took a human wife. So he was obviously enamored with human women, took a human wife, and he, he copulated with her, and they procreated uh, 10 twin hybrid sons. So five sets um, of twins that were part God, part human. Uh, so this is precisely what the Greek account is telling us is going on. And then what did they proceed to do? They proceeded to, to build the city of Atlantis, and to create this empire. And, and presumably, and this is what the other gods were doing as well. They were ruling over the earth. They were, in many cases, not just in the, in the Greek accounts, but basically all of the accounts all over the earth, they're copulating with human women, they're procreating offspring, and they're governing, they're ruling over the rest of the populace. And so if the gods are in a league together, which they always are, right? You have Mount Olympus and you have the gods on Mount Olympus, uh, Mount Olympus who were in a league and the, the Greek pantheon, the same thing in the Roman pantheon. Sometimes they're fighting among each other, but for the most part, they're, 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 um, they're cooperating, right? They have, they have a, they have a, uh, a mutual goal in mind for what they're doing on earth. And that's exactly what the biblical account says about the watchers in the extra biblical account that they, that they came down, they bound themselves by mutual implications. They, they swore an oath on the summit of Mount Hermon, which is where they descended. And then they proceeded to go and do exactly what all these myths say they were doing. They were taking human women as wives. That's a very important um, point because they weren't just fornicating with these women, they were taking them as wives. And there's a whole little deal there if you want to talk about why they were doing that and, and the dynamics involved in that. But they were procreating offspring and they were dominating the earth. So they apportioned the earth amongst themselves so that they could all have their own little corner of the planet that they ruled over with their offspring. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, as judgment in the book of Enoch, uh, it's described as judgment from God that uh, God sent... I believe it was uh, Uriel or, or Michael, one of the uh, other uh, angels, to the earth to entice them to war with each other. And so in the biblical account, and by the way, the reason why I bring this up is because you also find this in the other accounts, especially in the Indian accounts, in the Vedas and so forth. You find, you find the, uh, uh, as the, the ancient Sanskrit narratives, you find the gods going to war with each other, right? So it wasn't just this peaceful wonderful time where the gods are all hanging out in gardens and enjoying life 
they were at some point enticed to war, according to the myths, and they went to war. And, and it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was kingdom against kingdom. You know, this God and his offspring and his kingdom against this God and his offspring and his kingdom, kingdom, and they, and they went, and they went at it. And so, uh, that, and that preceded the flood that preceded the cataclysm. So you have these, you have these, and I'm trying to be very general here so I can encompass all of the myths together instead of, instead of just referring to one specific, you know, just referring to the Hebrew account or just referring to the Sumerian account or just referring to the Egyptian account, I'm trying to be very general that kind of encompasses all of the stories together. So the gods go to war and then cataclysm strikes. And again, I think that the cataclysm was probably due to an asteroid or a comet uh, impacting the, the, uh, the ice sheets uh, somewhere on earth, either probably in the Northern hemisphere. You state also somewhere that other sources talk about how the 10 twin sons of Poseidon were probably giants. And then you mention, I think in chapter seven or eight of your book, and again, we're talking about Timothy's new book, Birthright. Um, you say, quote, the ancients maintained that megaliths were built by the offspring of the gods, a myth preserved to this day in the term used by archaeologists to describe their trademark architecture, cyclopean. Uh, end quote. Timothy, tell us more about the relationship between cyclopean megalithic architecture that can still be seen today and then the gods of the golden age. Uh, the Greeks believed that the cyclopes, who were the offspring of the gods, um, they were demigods. They uh, were the great masons, metalsmiths of the, of the golden age and of, and, and of, of the deep past of, of the antediluvian world. And, you know, of course, there's the, there's the, the story about how the Cyclopes forged uh, Zeus's lightning bolts and so forth. So, you, so the, the the Greeks are are always making making a point that these were the these were the top artisans and masons and metalsmiths, the Cyclopes. Um, now it's important to recognize that uh, to the lay people, and this is the way it is today in in many respects, to the lay populace, the general populace. The myths were taken literally. The myths were taken as literal stories, literal history that I have no doubt in my mind that the lay Greek population and the lay Roman population believed that the gods were really up there on Mount Olympus and that uh, they were exactly as the myths described them and that they actually did these things, that the Cyclopes actually forged Zeus's lightning bolts. bolts. But there's no way and I think there's indications of this all over the place. There's no way that the sages and the wise and those keepers of knowledge in these cultures, in these societies, again, the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Sumerians, even the Inca, the Amautas, the, 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 the Grandes Amautas, the great Amautas of the Incas. There's no way they believed that the gods were actually reposing on top of Mount Hermon or on top of Mount Olympus or up in Machu Picchu. Uh, and there's no way that they believed that these fables were actual literal history. They knew, the sages, these ancient sages knew that what, these, what the myths represented was, was a vehicle through which to convey knowledge. And so to the lay people, they couldn't unpack those myths. They, they didn't have the knowledge and the wisdom, the understanding to unpack the myths. But the sages did. And so the sages would take the myths and they could unpack them. They could extract them like a zipped archive, like a zipped folder and extract the scientific knowledge, which is often referring to uh, things related to cosmological events, the procession of the equinoxes, uh, things of this nature um, and other things, other things. And so when we talk about myth and legend, uh, you know, it's important to, to recognize also that, 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 that there is, there's, there's myth as it was perceived and believed by the general populace, the lay populace, and then there is the, the true function of myth, which was to convey knowledge, to preserve and convey knowledge through the ages, and only the wise could interpret it. Only those who had the knowledge could take those myths and understand what they were really saying and use them in any kind of practical way. Um, so getting back to the Cyclopes, 
uh, the, that's not to say, however, that there weren't actual giants in the antediluvian world. I absolutely believe that there were actual giants, and in fact still are to this day, uh, uh, living in certain places. I do believe that. And I have reason to believe that. It's, it's not just because I like to believe in bedtime stories. I have, I have um, a logical reason for believing that, the gi that giants existed and that it's very possible that they still exist in, in remote circumstances. Um, and uh, so what were there actual cyclopes beings, these beings with the one eye? I don't know. I really don't. Uh, maybe. I think that it's possible. I'm absolutely convinced there were giants. I have no question. I've seen plenty of evidence that there were giants. Um, but I do know that the Cyclopes is a symbol. Whether it was a real creature, I don't know. But I do know that it was a symbol. The Cyclops was the symbol of the great masons and, and of the knowledge in general the, from the Antilope antediluvian world. So it symbolizes the great builders. I believe specifically the megalith builders. That's what this cyclopes symbolizes. One of the thing, one of the things it symbolizes in Greek mythology are these, these great masons, and again, artisans and metalsmiths of the ancient, of the antediluvian world, of the pre-flood world. But they also symbolize the offspring of the gods in general. And so, um, so it's, it's kind of like walking a fine line here with some of these myths. I think that some of the things that the myths are referring to are literally true, but much of what the myths are referring to are symbolically true, are metaphorically true. And so uh, the Cyclopes, uh, the Greeks believe the Cyclopes, that the Cyclopes were the ones who had built the megaliths, the, in, in Egypt, in the Peloponnesus and in, in, in other parts of, I'm sorry, in Greece. And when they came across, when the ancient Greeks came across these ruins, these megalithic ruins that they're looking at, just like we look at them today and say, how in the world, you know, were these moved or were these constructed? They attributed them to the Cyclopes. Um, the wise among the Greeks, in their minds, that would have meant the inhabitants of the antediluvian world. The lay people among the Greeks would have literally envisioned these giant beings with one eyes, you know, building these megaliths. Fascinating. Yeah, and it's, I think, you know, Peru and, and Egypt gets most of the love when it comes to megalithic architecture, but I think some of the most underrated sites are probably in Greece and Italy. The Cyclopean architecture uh, and I'm, I've been finding more and more sites. You just, when you think you've seen all the megalithic sites, there's one you haven't seen. And I mean, the, the stuff in Greece is crazy looking, the Cyclopean architecture, how it's no specific rhythm to it as, or at least as it seems, but it's just perfectly mortarless as you state. Yep. Um, polygonal. Yeah. Polygonal. You which, make the, which building uh, a polygonal wall without mortar is not an easy thing to do. That is not an easy thing to do especially building it to the precision that you see like in Peru, um, which is at Ojante Tambo, for example, which is absolutely mind blowing. But we have to always remember when thinking about megaliths, the, the, the stone matters. If you have megalithic constructions built out of limestone, they're gonna be greatly deteriorated. What you're gonna see is a shadow, a mere shadow of what that construction once was, like in Malta. In Malta, it's all limestone in Malta. And so the megaliths are greatly deteriorated. You go to Peru, you know, Jante Tambo, the foundations of Machu Picchu, the foundations of Cusco, Sacsayhuaman, you're looking at, in many cases, much harder stone. You're looking at andesite, you're looking at granite. And so you can still appreciate how precise and exquisite these walls were in their original condition. In Greece, you have a lot of softer rock out there. And so when you're looking at these walls, these megalithic walls in Greece, um, you can see they're polygonal. And then sometimes you'll see between big polygonal blocks, smaller ones, and, and people will assume, oh, they must have stuck smaller ones. No, probably not. That was probably part of the big block and it just, fract it just fractured over time and deteriorated. So I believe that the megalithic walls in, in Greece if they were built of andesite and granite, 
would look exactly like the megalithic walls in Peru. Exactly. The same thing can be said of the megalithic walls in Malta. If they were built of andesite and granite and basalt rather than limestone, it would be much easier for archaeologists to look at those megaliths in Malta and then look at Peru and say, hey, this looks like the same builders or at least the same knowledge, but they don't do that. They don't do that because there's an isolationist perspective and so forth. But um, that's why it's so easy for people to view these things in isolation, because you're looking at different levels of deterioration, different kinds of stone that were used incorporated in these walls. But there are some walls. In fact, I have this in the episode for the TV show I'm working on right now. I have a, a comparison between the walls at um, uh, Tiryns in, in Greece and the walls, uh, the polygonal walls at Machu Picchu. And I mean, there's really no difference. It's literally the same architectural style. And um, it, it, by the way, the, the foundation, something that most people don't realize about Peru, um, is that the foundations of Machu Picchu are absolutely megalithic. The foundations. Uh, and and um, Machu Picchu means the, the Inca called Machu Picchu Ijampu. Ijampu means the habitation of the gods, the dwelling of the gods or the repose of the gods. It was a place, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like Olympus, right? Olympus, the summit of Olympus, the summit of Hermon, the summit of uh, Meru or whatever that mountain's called in, um, in China, where the gods reposed, right? Where the gods held court, where the, the garden on top of the mountain. That whole idea is ubiquitous. And in Peru, that's Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. And so, and so what you have is you have these cultures who are coming later in the post-flood context, uh, in a post-Diluvian context, and they are finding the residue of these megalithic constructions. The Inca, for example, at Machu Picchu, coming upon these megalithic constructions and recognizing that this must have been where the gods live. Why? Because they had the same reaction that we do when we see megaliths, the really impressive ones. Like, wow, who could have done this? This must have been really hard. The people who did this must have been really smart, right? They had the same thoughts, even more so because they were more primitive than we are today. And so their rationalization was only the gods could have built this. And so what do you think they did? especially in the case of like the Inca who consider themselves to be the rightful inheritors of the gods, of the works of the gods, because they were the offspring of the gods, according to their, according to their, you know, contrived history, they were the children of the sun. So they come upon Machu Picchu. They see these amazing megalithic constructions. They say, this is Ijampu, the habitation of the gods, the former habitation of the gods. What happened to the gods? Where did they go? They were, their, their empire was destroyed. It's part of the old world. And so what are we going to do as Inca princes? We're going to rebuild and re-inhabit the habitation of the gods. And it's the same across the earth. It's what everybody's always doing. We're going to rebuild. We're going to re-inhabit. We're going to rebuild on top of those walls. Now, we don't have, you know, if we're Inca, we're looking at these megalithic walls. We don't have the technology. I don't believe they did or the knowledge to do it, but we're going to try our best to copy it. So we're going to do it on a smaller scale. We're going to try and make the polygonal blocks and, and to some success on a smaller scale. And we're going to we're going to build on top of those megaliths. And 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 in doing so, we're, we our, our desire, our hope, our aspiration is to recover some relic of the glory of the gods and of the golden age. And this is what's happening all over the earth. This is exactly the, the MO all over the planet. And it's been that way. All these ancient cultures, ubiquitously, universally noticed, uh, um, um, remembered the golden age and always were wanting to emulate that time and that world and the gods and the empire of the gods and the great kings and the great princes wanted to style themselves as reincarnations or the offspring of the gods and rebuild their temples and build on, on their foundations and re-inhabit uh, their ancient works. 
and and um, and it's amazing to me that mainstream archaeologists do not acknowledge this very simple and logical reality. When I went to Peru several years ago, yeah, I was blown away by Machu Picchu because you know when you are looking at images online or any travel guide about Machu Picchu, you know, you see the mountain and you see all the Inca stonework, which is pretty awesome in its own right, but nothing really shows this megalithic core foundation you're talking about at Machu Picchu. And then you get there and it really stands out like a sore thumb, this white granite that's, I mean, clearly superior to all the other small rough stone and clay mortar stuff that's built on top. And so that, to me, would explain exactly what you're saying. The Inca were um, emulating, building on top of this megalithic foundation that, you know, preceded it by thousands of years, probably, and were doing their best. To, and you see all kinds of examples of that, right? And we have to also remember that when we go to these sites, I've been all over the world um, looking at megaliths. When you go to uh, when you go to um, uh, Machu Picchu in Peru. When you go to um, obviously Egypt, but when you go to uh, Malta, you always have to remember that much of what you're looking at is a a conjectured reconstruction by archaeologists. And why are they doing this? Tourism. So the cooler an ancient ruin looks, the more likely it's going to draw tourists. So they're going to try and rebuild the walls. In some cases, they're going to try and rebuild the doorways and they're going to say, you know, the door was probably this high. And so they're going to put the header stone on there. And this is what archaeologists do. And, and, and oftentimes funded by the, these their nations that these sites are in, like in Peru, the government's looking at this. Let's rebuild this. Let's make it look really amazing so that it attracts tourism. So oftentimes what we're looking at is a conceptualized, contrived reconstruction and so it even conflates the situation even more because clearly you have um, in certain parts of Machu Picchu, you have the Inca, that clear Inca. This was old. You can tell it was there for a long time. This was not reconstruction because there's lots of stuff on top of it. And you can see where the megalithic stones literally just end. And it's not a nice, like a nice, even layer of megaliths. It's like it's like, looks like it was just like a, like a ruined wall, right? And then somebody came in and just filled it in. And why would the Inca do that? If this site was so Machu Picchu, if it was so sacred to the Inca, and it was, why would they not rebuild the walls using, let's say they built the, let's say the Inca did build the megalithic foundations. Why would they stop? and then use smaller stones to repair them. Who does that? If it was so easy for you to build this thing, just repair it with the big megalithic stones. But that's never the case, ever, never the case. You always see the repair jobs done with inferior skill, smaller stones, inferior skill. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, we wouldn't do that and they wouldn't do that. It's not intuitive and it's not practical. And by the way, and I think this is surely something you're very aware, with, aware of in your audience, the, the, the most impressive feature of megaliths, true megaliths, is not the size of the stones. Large megalithic stones can be moved by primitive people. They can. And they are, even to this day. They can. And in precisely the manner that archaeologists say, you can move a huge stone with ropes and sleds and lots of people, lots of manpower. You can. They're doing it in India today. They're still doing it in ceremonial stuff. You can see it on YouTube. Um, however, that's not the thing that's most impressive about megaliths. Cutting the stone and assembling the, the stones the way that they do, that's now you're talking, now you're not just talking about dragging something heavy. Now you're talking about mathematics. Now you're talking about engineering. Now you're talking about science, okay? Dragging a stone through the woods on a sled, there's very little knowledge involved in that. But when you start to erect these stones and build things with them, then you're operating on a level like, you know, that, that it took a long time uh, for the Greeks and the Romans to figure out how to do this. And they weren't even really working with 
the size stones that are that are uh, like in the walls of Sacsayhuaman, for example. In some cases, the Romans the Romans were incredible. They really were. They were amazing builders. Um, but the point is this: none of that, what I just mentioned, is really the thing that is most astounding about megaliths. What what is most astounding about the megaliths? What the Romans could not rival, what the Greeks could not rival, didn't even come close, is the anti seismic properties of those walls forget it the roman stuff falls down in in earthquakes and has and always has to be repaired the greek stuff has through the through the ages crumbled and fallen and dilapidated because of earthquakes and so forth and floods and things but when you are standing in front front of a truly megalithic wall that is still pretty much intact and remember these walls are always going to be subject to people coming and taking the smaller portions off to build other things, right? They're always going to repurpose the walls. Whatever cultures around is going to come over. They want to build a wall, you know, around their, uh, around their a field, right? What are they going to do? Are they going to go quarry new stones? No, they're going to go over to that megalithic building over there, megalithic complex, and they're going to find the stones that are manageable and they're going to take them away. So all that you're going to be left with are the stones that are unmanageable, Right. And when you look at these stones, large portions of these walls are still standing today, like Sacsayhuaman. They are built on a precise inclination. They are so well fitted together that it's apparent that they have withstood hundreds, if not thousands of years of seismic, extreme seismic activity, like Cusco. In Cusco, you have in the city of Cusco, walk through the streets of Cusco, you're going to see three kinds, at least three different kinds of construction. You're going to see, aside from the modern construction, you're going to see the Inca. You're going to see their stuff. You're going to see the Spanish, who repurposed a lot of the Inca stuff. And you're going to see something far more impressive than either of those. I mean, in amazing. Uh, for example, in the, in the, in the Roca Temple um, near the plaza, you're going to see amazing megalithic constructions, and Cusco has been subject to really violent seismic activity for a long time. In fact, there, we have in the historical records um, routinely uh, massive earthquakes hitting periodically hitting Cusco and knocking down the cathedrals, right? Leveling the cathedrals, leveling the Inca palaces. But guess what doesn't fall? The megalithic walls are not moved. Why? Because they were specifically designed to withstand seismic uh, perturbations of the earth. They were, they, were, they were designed to flex, to sway with seismic waves. And everything else around them just breaks apart and falls down. That is technology. That is knowledge. That is, that is ancient knowledge that even surpasses our ability today to build stone walls. Now we can build skyscrapers and stuff. I'm talking about masonry, stone. To build stone walls that would last that long, subject, uh, subjugated to that much, uh, subject to that much seismic activity, and yet still pristine. That's what we need to think about when we look at these megaliths. You know, size of the stones, yeah, that's impressive. The way they're config cut and configured, even more impressive. But the seismic, the anti-seismic capabilities, the technology involved to make these walls anti-seismic, the knowledge, that is where I think uh, we should be most impressed when we're looking at these walls. And you live, just so people know, in Peru for several years, it sounds like. So two things. I want to know, do you have a favorite uh, megalithic site in Peru? One. And then in your documentary film series, uh, True Legends, Technology of the Fallen, you share a myriad of accounts that you found from Spanish chroniclers documenting the existence of giant skeleton bones that were seen in Peru. I mean, there's so many. Yeah. Either all of these guys were lying or there's something to it. So do you have a favorite yeah. site? And, um, and tell us a little bit about these accounts. Well, my favorite site, you got to, you got to, we have to, we have to, we have to pick a category. Um, 
of, you know, for example, if we talk about the most exquisite walls that I've ever seen in my life, that's Ojante Tambo. So in terms of the, of the, of the sheer precision of the megalithic walls, Ojante Tambo is my favorite site. But if you talk about just the jaw dropping enormity of the megaliths, it's Sacsayhuaman. And if you talk about just the, um, just the picturesque beauty of the site, it's Machu Picchu. So um, really, that's how I would uh, divide those. That's how I would uh, determine that. So if we're just talking about, like I said, just the jaw dropping, if you've never seen a megalithic wall and you want to be absolutely stunned, go to Sacsayhuaman. Go to Sacsayhuaman in Cusco. If you've never seen a megalithic wall, you, 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 you will be picking your jaw up after, off the floor.